Okay. All right. I think we have all of our technological issues resolved, so thank you for your patience. The last issue was me getting snagged on a pew and pulling apart the cord that I am still snagged by, so we're just going to awkwardly wait until I get this figured out, or else I won't be able to focus. There we go. Okay, hopefully you received an outline on your way in, uh, so it is good to see you guys. I want to begin like we did last week. We'll have a prayer in just a moment, uh, but I want to be able to highlight a couple missional ways for us to be praying tonight. Um, we last week highlighted the Mangrum family that was sent from the South Carolina Baptist Convention tonight. I want to tell you a little bit about the Edney family, uh, and I don't know, do we have a graphic of that one up? Oh, it just popped up, nice. This is the Edney family, this is uh, Jonathan and Becca, and their son Benjamin, their other son Matthew, their daughter Bella, and they serve a Portuguese-speaking community here in Charleston. And uh, so they spent 10 years with the International Mission Board. Uh, then they were given a new mission field, the Diaspora in Charleston. So they would be focused ministry on those who have uh, immigrated into the states, found themselves in Charleston. In 2020, they began the church planting process with a growing Portuguese-speaking population in the Low Country. Uh, they know that language learning is a huge need in both missionary life and in immigration. So they began in English as a second language ministry that now serves, this is pretty impressive to me, not only do they serve Brazilians, but over 300 students from 17 different countries uh, that they're able to serve now. And so they are some of our state missionaries uh, serving the nations right here in our state. And so they give us a few ways to pray, and I'll lead a prayer in just a minute according to these. Uh, I do not have information on the full name of their church, but it's the same initials as ours, CBC. So they ask to pray for CBC's growing small group ministry and for leadership for each small group. Uh, they ask for prayer for the growing ESL ministry. Uh, they ask for prayer for their endurance as local missionaries. And then they ask that we pray for their children as they grow in their own faith as well. So we'll pray for them uh, as local state missionaries. Uh, let me also highlight another unreached people group in our world. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this people group. Uh, I've seen things on the news probably over the last two or three years or so. Uh, I believe it is pronounced the Uyghur people. It's spelled U-Y-G-H-U-R. They are a people group in China. Uh, there are millions of Uyghurs who live in China's northwestern Xinjiang U Uyghur Autonomous Region. Uh, and you may have heard about this people group in the news because this is a police state that now imprisons well over one million Uyghurs in re-education camps, is what they're called. Uh, so we want to pray for them. They are unreached in terms of gospel presence uh, there are ways for us to pray for them to get outreach and ministry. Uh, we want to pray that the Uyghurs would listen to believers who demonstrate the compassion and love of the only Savior. Uh, we know that their language contains the complete Bible, so we're thankful for that. The Jesus film is also available in their language. There are other materials, audio and visual uh, materials based on the Bible that are available uh, which is wonderful, but you can only imagine how hard it must be uh, for them to hear anything about the gospel. If they, as a people group, are already unreached with the gospel, and on top of that, uh, their country is forcing them to live uh, in these re-education camps, um, obviously prohibiting a lot of interaction in and out. Here are other ways to pray. We're going to ask God to disciple the believers who are in this people group for Uyghur believers to start a disciple-making movement uh, for their communities throughout China. We're going to pray that God would, store, uh, would stir Chinese Christians to intercede for and to reach out to China's suffering Uyghurs. And then we're going to ask that uh, suffering Uyghurs would experience God's comfort from within the re-education camps and the broken homes. Uh, so I, I really want us to try as much as we can uh, to feel compassion for these people let our hearts go out to them 
in prayer for just a few moments before we enjoy something that they could hardly even imagine in the freedoms that we're experiencing right now. So would you bow your heads and just take a few minutes with me, uh, joining your hearts in prayer. God, I thank you for the opportunity to come here this afternoon. We want to be grateful for that. While we're here, we want to be mindful of ministry taking place for the sake of the nations, whether that's in another nation or even within our own state. So I thank you for these state missionaries, for Jonathan and Becca Edney. I thank you for their children, Benjamin, Matthew, and Bella. I thank you for the years they spent with the IMB and, and the experience that they have in their former ministry and now the fruit that they're able to celebrate in their current ministry, especially with this ESL ministry among those who speak Portuguese. God, we want to pray for them. Lord, perhaps none of us in here knows them. And we, here we are just a couple hours away able to, to intercede as our brothers and sisters, Lord, to intercede for them. And so we pray for their church's small group ministry. I thank you that it is growing. Pray that that would continue. And we pray for, pray for leadership. We know that when small groups grow, there's a need for leadership. And so we ask that the Edneys watch you provide the leadership that they need. God, we also pray for their ESL ministry. I thank you that it's growing and bearing fruit. We pray that that would continue. We praise you for these over 300 students from 17 different countries that are able to hear about the gospel and be encouraged in the name of Jesus. We pray that, that those numbers, if you see fit, would continue to increase, that there would be an expanding ministry. Lord, they're asking for endurance. And all we can do, Lord, is sit here and imagine what it is that's challenging endurance from time to time for them, what, what a hard day may feel like and look like for them. Uh, we pray that they will endure well, that they will run the race well, that they would be patient as needed, that they would have the energy that they need, the, uh, the clarity and wisdom they need to keep moving forward, taking the right steps. And Lord, we want to pray for their children and for the faith of their children, that they'll grow in their faith. So by name, again, we pray for Benjamin and Matthew and Bella, praying, Lord, that you will, as needed, if, if still as needed, they would come to faith and that uh, they would be discipled well in their faith. And we pray for 30, 60, and 100-fold fruit in their lives. God, we want to pray for the Uyghurs in China. Lord, I pray that you would grow our hearts in compassion for people groups that are living in circumstances like this. It's too easy for us maybe not to be fully aware. Um, it might even be too easy for us to kind of turn away from thinking about them. And Lord, we don't want to do that, at least not right now in this moment. Lord, I thank you that I can pray to the God of the universe who is very aware of these millions of weakers. Very aware of the over one million Uyghurs who are in re-education camps, Lord. Lord, I, I shudder to think what they really are. God, I pray that you will move in a way that only you can move, in a way that demonstrates omnipotence, that you would ease suffering for them, that you would enhance freedom for them. God, I pray that for the believers who are among them, and, and I would imagine that there may be some, we just don't know about them, there may be a handful I pray that those believers as listed in this file would demonstrate the compassion and love of Jesus, the only Savior. I thank you that their language has materials available in gospel teaching format for them. We pray that, that you'd see ways to, to make it available for them, to be able to read scriptures, to, to be able to watch films or helpful materials to read about that help understand the gospel, the name of Jesus. God, we pray for Uyghur believers that they would be able to begin making disciples and that it would become a movement. It would become a multiplying movement where disciples would reach the unreached with the gospel and they would come to faith and share that news with others and it would spread. We pray for that. Lord, I pray that you would stir up 
Chinese Christians who can intercede for, advocate, reach out to the Uyghurs and show them and tell them the love of Jesus. And Lord, I pray that, that you would ease their suffering, that they would find that you are their source of comfort. And God, it, it does feel small for us just to spend a couple minutes praying for them, knowing that the, the significance of this people group and their circumstances is beyond our ability to comprehend. But Lord, we know it's not beyond yours. And so I ask, Lord, that we believe in the power of prayer by your grace that we would grow in our belief in the power of prayer. And so we thank you that you've heard our prayers. Lord, now I pray that you will use this time. Lord, you've drawn us together to, to spend more time in the word, to equip ourselves in scripture, to, to edify our faith. So help us to do that now. I pray for our small group leaders represented in here that this would be a helpful time for them. Good insight. I thank you for all who have come. I pray that we glean what you have for us as we look in the Gospels and Acts. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so last week I ran out of time after we just kind of quickly surveyed the beginnings of each gospel, and the, the plan next was to look at the endings. So I've just taken that portion of last week's le uh, lecture and started lecture two with it. So I want us to glance at the endings of the gospels. You can go ahead and turn to the last part of uh, Matthew. We're just going to kind of look through them for a few minutes. I want to define what I'm uh, labeling as the ending of the Gospels. It's the resurrection and after. So the word resurrection is your first blank, uh, which reminds me I need to brag on myself for just a minute if you'll allow me. Um, I figured out how to restock our office workroom stapler today. And I just needed you to know that. It's an automatic stapler. Thank you. Thank you. It's an automatic electronic stapler, and it ran out, and Debbie wasn't there, and I usually need her for moments like that, but I made it happen, y'all. And I was telling myself, I'm going to brag to them about that, as I'm stapling 70 copies of this, and then the Lord humbled me again, because I realized that when I made the copies, I only copied one side of the copies, and so y'all were only getting page uh, 8 and 10, or whatever it is, 9 and 11, and not the others, and so I threw that whole batch away that I had stapled. And did a new batch. So uh, the Lord humbled me pretty quickly. So I needed to share that. Thank you. I appreciate your encouragement there. All that to say the ending of the Gospels is the resurrection account and everything that happens after that. So uh, that would be Matthew 28 verses 1 through 20. Mark chapter 16 verses 1 through 20. Luke chapter 24 verses 1 through 53. And John chapter 20, verse 1 through chapter 21, verse 25. So find Matthew 28 if you haven't already. We're just going to glance, kind of cruise through these. Verses 1 through 10 give us the resurrection account uh, of Matthew. What I'd like to do is just read some of the, uh, the direct dialogue that takes place in each of these accounts. If you'll look at verses uh, 5 through 7. An angel speaks to uh, the women. It says, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. Then if you look at verses 9 and 10, they come across Jesus. And he says, greetings. And they came up, took hold of his feet, worshipped him. Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. So what we'll do is we'll read the direct statements being made to the disciples in each of these and just kind of take note of how they're a little distinct, each one of them. After verses 1 through 10, which give us the resurrection account, at verses 11 through 15, you have this account of the guards' conspiracy. The guards' conspiracy. Verse 11, while they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. Okay, you can imagine how alarmed they are. Uh, they were in charge of keeping that tomb secure, 
and it's empty. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient, a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story, Matthew says, has been spread among the Jews to this day. That's the guards' conspiracy. And then in the next verse, we have the, uh, the very end of the gospel, famously known as the Great Commission. So we'll go ahead and, and just read that to finish off this book. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountains to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the, uh, name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. That is how the book of Matthew ends. All right, so let's go ahead and go to Mark 16. And just take a glance at how it finishes. Obviously, there'll be some significant similarities. And then some distinctions, which is something I want us to be thinking well on over the next week or two, is how the Gospels are both similar and distinct in so many ways. So the resurrection account is verses 1 through 8. Uh, the dialogue statements are found in verse 6 and 7. It says, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen he is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell the disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So verses 1 through 8 give us the resurrection account. Verses 9 through 11, Jesus appears to Mary. Verses 12 through 13, Jesus appears to two other disciples. And then in verses 14 through 20, we have Mark's version of the Great Commission. Let's just take a glance at that. Afterward, he appeared to the eleven of uh, themselves as they were reclining at table, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. Then they will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God, and they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. I hope you noticed the brackets. Uh, we'll kind of touch on that just very briefly uh, later on, but that's, that's how our copy of the book of Mark finishes through verse 20. Okay, so let's glance in Luke 24 uh, to see a little bit how, how Luke finishes his gospel account. The resurrection account is narrated in verses 1 through 12. Uh, verses 5 through 7 give us the direct dialogue. Why do you seek the living among the dead. He is not here, but has risen. I feel like maybe this is a risky way to put it, but it's okay to kind of have favorites, I guess, in some ways. I feel like that's kind of my favorite one. It just, it just pops. Why do you seek the living among the dead? There's just a rhetorical power to how that question is stated. He's not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day, rise. Then in verses 13 through 35, one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture is what we can refer to as the Emmaus appearance. It's where Jesus shows up and starts walking along with two disciples who are going back home to a village named Emmaus. It is a wonderful story. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, I would encourage you to kind of Read through it slowly and just sort of enjoy what that moment must have been like. Then after the Emmaus appearance, appearance in verses 36 through 49, we have the Jerusalem appearance. Um, those, those disciples run back to Jerusalem to find out that uh, Jesus has been appearing to others and, and then he appears again. Pretty fascinating way for the gospel account to end. We have the ascension in verses 50 through 53. Let's just read that passage real quickly. And he led them out as far as Bethany. And lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple 
blessing God. So that's how the book of Luke ends. And now let's go to John chapter 20. Two chapters are, uh, are the ending for the book of John according to how we defined it. The resurrection account is verses 1 through 18. Uh, if you'll look in verse 13, you see uh, the angels asking, Woman, why are you weeping? And then she answers, they've taken away my Lord. I do not know where they've laid him. Uh, and then she turns around. She je- sees Jesus. She doesn't know it's Jesus. And then Jesus speaks to her directly. Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Then he said, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. And one thing I'd recommend you do, you've got these uh, references uh, in your notes. Uh, It might be worthwhile during the week. Maybe look at those same passages I just read of the the dialogue that takes place at the resurrection account. And just think about it. What is it that you notice? How are there similarities? How are there differences? Uh, why might there be those differences? Why might there be those similarities? It's a very helpful thing to do. Uh, and we're going to talk more about how do we kind of let the gospel accounts uh, help inform with insight for one another. Uh, and so that would be a good way to kind of prime that pump, to start thinking about, okay, what do, what do we learn here? So, so back in John, verses 1 through 18 of chapter 20, give us the resurrection account. Verses 19 through 23, give us an appearance and a great commission Uh, Let's see John's version of the Great Commission. Uh, We would find that in really verse 22. When he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Then in uh, chapter 20, verses 24 through 29, uh, this is the part Thomas probably wishes, wishes was not in the Bible. This is where he's doubting. Jesus and has to be confronted by Jesus there. Then in verse 30 and 31, let's go ahead and look at those verses. This is a purpose statement. This is a wonderful, distinct passage for John. He tells us uh, why he wrote. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Then in chapter 21, verses 1 through 14, we have Uh, One of the miraculous catches of fish episodes, this one is after Jesus' resurrection. There's another one when he's calling his disciples. This one takes place after Jesus' resurrection. And let's see, is this one? Yes, this is the one where they count the fish. In verse 11, 153 fish. Feel free to play some Bible trivia with folks in your family and ask them, where do you find the number of fish caught and how many? Right here in John 21, verses 1 through 14. Then beginning in verse 15 through verse 23, uh, 23, uh, Peter is reinstated into ministry. So three times Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? And Peter has to go through that threefold conversation with his Lord to be reinstated into ministry after he denied Jesus for three times. And then we have the conclusion in verse 24 and 25. Let's read those two verses. This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things. And we know that his testimony is true. Uh, we saw that last week when we were looking at who John was. Then verse 25, now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were, were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. As a bibliophile, I just love that verse. It's fascinating thought. And that is how the book of John ends. And so those are, that's just a quick glance at the way uh, the four Gospels end. In a moment, I do want to spend some time looking at some of what I would consider the key passages of each Gospel. Uh, but before we do that, let's go ahead and give away some books here. If you are interested in receiving books. All right, I need a color reminder here. Nikki, you brought these four. Do you know the color? Teachers are Teachers are yellow. And then everyone else is blue. We have determined that that means the blue are, y'all are the knots. If you signed up, it's it's your not a small group leader, which means these are the not knots, okay? The small group leaders are the not knots. Let me give away 
some copies of our, our primary giveaway book, Discipling How to Help Others Follow Jesus. And this copy is going to, and if, you know what, if you or someone could kind of help come get these, I'll, I'll give a few away uh, just a little quicker. Sarah Westinger, I saw her walk in. Sarah, come on down. And uh, I'll just start slowly. We'll meet halfway. Everybody give her a round of applause. Okay, now you got a book report due on that. You know that, right? Just kidding. You don't. Congratulations, Sarah. Glad you got that. Let's see. Let's give another one away to Carol Dorman. Where's Carol? Come on down. There she is right here. Congratulations. You feel free to wave. I mean, do what you got to do. Yeah. Congratulations. Let's see here. This one is going to Karen Day right here. Karen, I think Karen has won multiple years, I believe. It. She's, she is living right, y'all. And then let's do one more of these. I think we're going to be symmetrical if I do that. J.D. Kleinabel. Where's J.D.? All right. Congratulations, J.D. I like, that was a nice strategy. Just take your time standing up, and then I'm, I'm here. By the time you get up, I'm here. Fantastic. That's fantastic. That's wisdom right there. I can't say he didn't meet me. He did. All right. Let's give away a couple of these. Let's see. Uh, I want to give a copy of the gospel, how the church portrays the beauty of Christ. And I had a small group leader tell me earlier, he really, he really hopes he gets one of these. I just told him to pray. Well, let's just see what happens. Are you kidding me? Doug Collier. <laughs> Almost like we set that up. You're li- he, I mean, just an hour and a half ago, I was like, man, I really want that gospel one. Well, you prayed well, sir. Amen. Congratulations. <laughs> Amen. That's fantastic. All right, let's do another one of these. This one belongs to Tish Klontz. Okay. Congratulations. Now, y'all see, Tish met me in the middle quickly. I appreciate that. If y'all all would just come sit up here, then you'd get all the credit for that. All right, let's do, uh, let's give a couple of these away here. Um, just a couple. I need y'all, I need somebody coming back next week. Uh, this is a book written by, I think I've given a book by John Piper away every, every year. Uh, he's one of my favorite authors and preachers. He writes such good stuff. The book here is called... A Peculiar Glory. I'm curious, is anybody already on this book? A Peculiar Glory. Okay. Matt, you got it? Yeah. Uh, The subtitle is this, How the Christian Scriptures Reveal Their Complete Truthfulness. Let me read that again. Just think about it. How the Christian Scriptures Reveal Their Complete Truthfulness. Uh, It's a very good book. Not the fastest read. I'd say just kind of take your time through it. And I will also say that there's a section in here that I have found to be one of the most practically helpful sections that I've ever read as a preacher. So for what it's worth, uh, that's in this book. So the first copy of A Peculiar Glory is going to Ginger Borky. All right. I'm coming. Which way are we going? Okay. Congratulations. You're good. This is the last one I'm going to do right now. Yeah, you're good. Thank you. And this copy of A Peculiar Glory is going to Gerard Del Pret right over here. Congratulations, sir. And I think that's good for now as far as giveaways go. So we'll get back into it. All right. Did you all see how smooth I was with that cough segue right there? Okay, I want to spend some time. I I just, what I'd like to do, and I admit it's a little risky to do this because it just kind of demands some selectivity, but I want to mention some passages that I would consider key passages in each gospel. And let me kind of remind you of one of the biggest goals of why we're doing these lectures. One of the biggest goals is just to help you get familiar with the content of the scriptures, And I think it helps if you just are reminded by key passages. 
in books. Like another one of our goals is, is to help us to grow as, uh, in our hermeneutical ability and things like that. Uh, but I want us to think about key passages, if for no other reason, just to help refresh you in what is, some, what is in uh, these books or some of the most, you know, sig- not significant. Again, I, I want to be careful here. Just some key passages, some famous passages. Uh, so, again, if you'll just take your copy of the Bible and just kind of flow through with me. Uh, the book of Matthew begins with the genealogy. I'm not going to read it, but I do consider that a very key passage. We'll see one of the reasons it has significance later on. Uh, your next blank is for the word discourses. Discourses, in other words, teachings, extended teachings. Uh, and Matthew is known to have five sections of discourses in it. It's one of the main characteristics of the structure of the book of Matthew. So if you'll go to chapter 5, what you see is he begins to teach. From chapter 5 through chapter 6 and chapter 7, that is known as the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, then, then there'll be some narrative of uh, miracles and ministry activity taking place. And then we get to chapter 10. There's another section of teaching. There's another prominent discourse in the book of Matthew. Then we have more ministry activity that takes place. If you go to chapter 13, then you have this discourse that's composed of lots of famous parables. Okay, in my book, in my Bible, the section headings are the parable of the sower, uh, then an explanation on the purpose of the parables, and then the parable of the sower explained. Then you have the parable of the weeds, uh, the mustard seed and the leaven, prophecy and parables, the parable of the weeds explained. You have the parable of the hidden treasure, the parable of the pearl of great value, the parable of the net, a statement on new and old treasures. And so that is another extended uh, section of Jesus' teaching. In this case, lots of parables. Then you have more activity taking place. You get to chapter 18. Then you have an extended session of teaching there. And then you have more ministry activity. And then in verse uh, chapters 23 through 25, there's another extended section, uh, three more chapters worth of teaching. Okay, so I just, I just want you to kind of know that, have some familiar, familiarity with that. It kind of helps us see uh, how, how the Lord made sure that the book of Matthew was designed, uh, kind of alternating between his activity and his teachings. Okay, you can go ahead and go all the way back to chapter 1 when we do this next thought. I want us to notice, and this happens in all of the, the Gospels, uh, in some form or fashion, even if it's just in hints about the Old Testament. But Matthew is known for lots of, uh, lots of locations where he shows that a portion of the Old Testament is being fulfilled. And so I just want to glance at these, uh, at each one of these. If you go to chapter, 20, uh, chapter 1, verse 22, okay, Matthew explains, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. So he quotes Isaiah 7, 14 there, then it explains the name of that, that, uh, the meaning of that name, which means God with us. Then then we go to chapter 2, find verse 15, and he says, right there in the middle of the verse, this was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. That's Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. Uh, looking back on when Jesus' family had to flee to and from Egypt, which we also looked at that last week as well. He's showing how it fulfills the Old Testament. Verse 17, then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. Uh, Jeremiah 3, verse 15. If we go from there to verse 23, he says, And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. Now, if you remember five years ago when I preached in this passage, that is sort of an intriguing one. It's not directly quoting any of the prophets. It's almost like a summary of, of much of what the prophets said. So that one kind of stands out. Yet he still says uh, that this uh, fulfilled what was spoken by the prophets. Okay, if we go from there to chapter 4, verse 14. Let me be clear. This is, these are not all the places where the Old Testament is referred to. 
These are where Matthew identifies that fulfillment is taking place. Specifically, he identifies it. Chapter 4, verse 14, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death on them, a light has dawned. Go to chapter 5, verse 17. This is where Jesus just says something that really kind of, especially after looking at what we've just seen, this is profound. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I mean, what a powerful statement, right? Chapter 8, verse 17, let's find that. In chapter 8, verse 17, Matthew explains, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. So he quotes Isaiah chapter 53, the the first part of verse 4, where Jesus has been healing people. and says this is a fulfillment of he took our illnesses and bore our diseases. Chapter 12, let's go to chapter 12, find verse 17. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen... My beloved with whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victory and in his name the Gentiles will hope. Chapter 13, verse 14. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, and now he quotes Isaiah 6, verses 9 and 10, you will indeed hear but never understand, and you will indeed see but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart in turn, and I would heal them. Okay, so he's quoting Isaiah 6, 9 and 10. Uh, just a couple comments on this one. Uh, just kind of in a way to integ- integrate what we're doing tonight with what we do every Sunday morning. Often in my sermon prayer, right before I preach, you'll hear me pray that the Lord would open our eyes and open our ears. Th- this is the, the passage, or the set of passages that informs that prayer. Now, just a few minutes ago, we were talking about the discourses of the book of Matthew. We find ourselves in chapter 13, which I pointed out was the teaching, the set of teaching that just had all these famous parables in it. And what we see is this comes in the section where Jesus is explaining to his disciples why he teaches everybody else in parables. And so you have a moment where Jesus is explaining why he teaches what he teaches. And one of the things he does is refer to the prophecy of Isaiah uh, to show the explanation there. Okay, just kind of a little extra layer uh, to what's going on in that text. The Old Testament is being used in an explanation of some of Jesus' teaching, which has been inscripturated into the New Testament. There's a lot going on there. Okay, if we go from chapter 13, verse 14 to verse 35, we have another occurrence here. Matthew says, This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. And then in chapter 21, verse 4. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. So I believe what we just did, hopefully you found it somewhat helpful and interesting, Uh, We just found every occurrence where Matthew as an author shows us how specifically what's going on or being said in his gospel account is fulfilling, in most cases, a very specific text of scripture. And then, of course, in the the two exceptions, the one about Jesus being born from Nazareth has a broader uh, attribution to the prophets as a whole. And then, of course, Matthew or Jesus himself saying that he has come to fulfill the prophets. Uh, so that's just one of the characteristics of the book of Matthew. Again, others do it as well. He's kind of known for doing it the most. And then, of course, the Great Commission. Now, we read it already. We don't need to glance there. Uh, but certainly, uh, we would need to see that the Great Commission 
is a key passage. Now, I'm sure that uh, there's a chance that you can think of some others, which is wonderful that you can. Those are just a few of the key passages from the book of Matthew that came to my mind. Uh, let me take you now to the book of Mark, and really just three places to, to look at here. If you go to Mark chapter 1, verse 1, I think one of the key verses which we highlighted last week, it's the very first verse. It's just such an important verse in the book of Mark. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now last week, uh, we acknowledged that, that, that scholars kind of presume that one of the reasons that this genre is referred to as the gospel is because of the first verse in Mark saying that this is the beginning of the gospel or the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then, of course, see what he does there. He immediately quotes Isaiah the prophet as well. Uh, and then he is off to the races uh, narrating a very fast-paced account of Jesus' ministry. So Mark chapter 1, verse 1 is a key verse. Chapter 10, verse 45, if you'll go there with me, uh, this is, I, I would say, one of the most famous verses from the book of Mark that has fed a lot of Christological discussion and why Jesus came and what was accomplished with his ministry and his death and resurrection. Uh, Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. So he's He's showing that he is an example of service, and then it's this last statement that really uh, has just filled shelves with writing, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Okay, that's a very key verse, Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, the ending is also key. I kind of told you we'd come back to this. Uh, in Mark chapter 16, beginning in verse 9, you'll... Perhaps, I would assume, every copy of the scriptures being used right now has verses 9 through 20 in brackets. And I, I hope there is some sort of an explanation, either a footnote or uh, some sort of like an inserted line. In my Bible, there's a little bit of an insertion, a bracket insertion that says this. Some of the earliest manuscripts do not include chapter 16, verses 9 through 20. Now, we preach through books of the Bible here, and so there are times where we have come across where there is usually what has happened is there's a verse that, that's not there. Like, it, it may, maybe it jumps from verse 17 to verse 19. Uh, and I've, I've never tried to kind of shy away from making sure we see that. I would certainly want people to be paying attention as we're preaching so they notice something like that. Well, in this case, it's kind of the reverse. Uh, the story of the woman caught in adultery in, in John is another example where it has brackets. And the explanation, again, is that some of the earliest manuscripts don't include these verses, okay? Now, let me just give you uh, a, a painfully simple and an admittedly uh, simple explanation of this. I have explained this before, I think probably in our first year of these. But we do not have the original copy of Mark. We don't have that. There is no copy that exists that is the one that Mark wrote in its entirety front to back. What we have is a bunch of manuscripts that may have all of Mark, that may have some of Mark, little fragments here and there. These things have been found over the years in all sorts of places. And the earliest ones don't include these verses, which would make Bible scholars, those who are trying to deal with the textual evidence that we have in history, would make them wonder, well, was it added later? Okay. And this is nothing to be like afraid of. This doesn't impact how we view uh, the reality of God's word and scripture. It's just causing the question among scholars to say, was this what Mark wrote or was it inserted later? Uh, and so I just wanted to acknowledge that. It's a very, uh, it's kind of a, a famous aspect to studying the book of Mark. And there it is. I want you to know that I'm aware of it. Uh, I will wrestle with that even more by the time that I preach through Mark. And praise the Lord, we have a resident expert because Kyle Hunsinger, your youth pastor, has preached through Mark and has studied this pretty extensively. And he can answer every question that you have <laughs> about Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20. Is that a fair statement, Kyle? <laughs> no, probably not. Uh, but, but in all seriousness, he's, he's read up quite a bit on it. Uh, I know Matt's read up quite a bit on it, and we've had some fun discussion. But I just wanted to acknowledge that's there, and it's a very intriguing thing. I know Doug, Doug taught through Mark. Doug got his book and left. I guess that was, uh, he, he, he said, I got what I wanted, I'm out of here. Oh, he's back, he's back. Okay, 
What were you back in the were you back in the mother's the mother's cry room? I'm just kidding. Doug taught through Mark and kind of wrestled with this as well. So if you if you want to just kind of pick their brains, uh, Kyle and Doug and Matt have some really good thoughts on it. And then I'll make a decision when I preach the book of Mark. Lord willing, whenever that is. Okay, let's look at some key passages in Luke. Uh, chapter 2 is huge. Of course, it's famous for uh, the, the Christmas narrative, but verses 1 through 50, uh, 52, such a distinct passage that give us quite a bit of information compared to the other books about his birth, his infancy, his childhood. We kind of glanced at those last week. Uh, in chapter 10, verses 25 through 37, that is the uh, parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to highlight this, and this is kind of uh, sort of taking a peek at, at something we'll try to um, kind of iron out a little bit uh, later on is that the parable of the Good Samaritan occurs in Luke and only in Luke. Okay, so it's a famous parable, number one, and it's Luke's. You know, it, it, it's, he's the one that has it in there. So uh, that's a good reason to kind of look at it as a key passage. Uh, Luke 15 is the, uh, the passage that has famously the parable of the prodigal. So it's a threefold parable being told. And so you have the parable of uh, the lost sheep. And that's the one that other gospel accounts have, I believe. And then the parable of the coin and the parable of the lost son. So you have the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son, and of course all the way to show us how the father handles that son and his brother. Uh, that is a very key passage in the book of Luke. And then I've mentioned... Uh, chapter 24 being one of my favorite passages in the Bible, verses 13 through 53. After Jesus is resurrected, he appears to the disciples going to Emmaus. He then appears in Jerusalem, and then he ascends. Uh, those are just some key passages in the book of Luke. Uh, then we go to John. Uh, last week, y'all allowed me to read to you the prologue, so I won't read it again. Uh, but verses 1 through 18, if I can just kind of reiterate, um, th this is just one of those passages of water, uh, of uh, a scripture that remind us how deep, like water, that's why I said that, uh, you can just swim deep into scripture. And even within 18 verses and then the way it's written, it, it's just one of those passages where you're like, yeah, the, the Holy Spirit inspired the Bible. I mean, there's just, there's just something about it. Um, there's a texture to it, uh, there's a profundity to it, and um, I, love, I love the passage of John. I believe, I've said for years, I still kind of would stick with this. Uh, if we can pick favorites, John's my favorite. Um, and uh, so, Lord willing, there will be a day where we get to go through the book of John together. i got to admit that it took me a little bit longer than it should have to recall that chapter 3, verse 16 would be considered a key passage in the book of John, the most famous verse, I would think, it's the most famous verse in the Bible, uh, John 3, 16, um, of course, Genesis 1, 1 would likely also be up there, but that is a key verse in John, and then you have these I am statements, okay, uh, let's do this, let's go to these passages, chapter 6, verse 35, you may know this already, that the book of John is known for having seven places where Jesus claims uh, the phrase, I am, and then he finishes that. So you have, this, you have this phrase, I am, that echoes the name of Yahweh, I am, and then he attaches these metaphors or these labels to it. So in chapter 6, verse 35, after he's fed the multitudes, he says, I am the bread of life. Okay, I am the bread of life. He says that in chapter 6, verse 35. He also says it again in verse 41. I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. So the first I am statement is I am the bread of life. In chapter 8, verse 12, let's go there. Let's see what he says there. Okay, see there in chapter 8, by the way, I mentioned how this is another one of those passages where they're bracketed. The woman caught in adultery versus uh, ch chapter 7, verse 33 through chapter 8, verse 11. That was the one I mentioned a minute ago. But look in chapter 12, or verse 12, excuse me. Chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Okay, the light of the world. Chapter 9, verse 5. I believe he echoes that. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So he is the bread of life. He is the light of the world. Chapter 10, verse 7. Let's see what he says there. Truly, truly, I say to you, 
I am the door of the sheep, or like the gate, I think is the idea. So, so I am the door of the sheep. Same chapter, just a few verses later, not only is the, the door to the sheepfold, but then he says, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. Okay, I am the good shepherd. In the next chapter, chapter 11, Nazareth, uh, Nazareth, Lazarus is dead, and he is uh, in a conversation with Martha. Verse 25, he says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. Uh, verse, chapter 14, verse 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. Okay, I am the way and the truth and the life. And then in chapter 15, I don't know if just maybe in one of my Sunday school classes growing up this was emphasized, but this one was the most famous for me growing up. I am the vine. He says, I am the true vine in verse 1, and my father is the vine dresser. Then in verse 5, I am the vine. This, this was like a memory verse in one of my Sunday school classes probably. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So those are seven I am statements. And yes, I think we ought to just note well, seven. I mean, that's interesting. We always know that that number's very significant throughout much of Scripture, and so I think it is intriguing. Uh, and just a little bit of biographical comment here. When I started my ministry, uh, as a reminder, the, the full-time ministry I did before I came here was I was a children's pastor, and the very first series that I preached to the kids, and yes, I preached the expositional preaching to five- to seven-year-olds the seven I am statements, the children of Germantown Baptist Church got to hear a seven-part series on the I am statements. I illustrated them likely in different ways than I would illustrate them for you uh, from the pulpit on Sunday morning here. But those are the seven I am statements. John is very famous for those. And then he is also famous for, look here, seven signs or miracles. Uh, the, the first, almost the first half basically of the book of John, chapters 1 through 12, is referred to as the book of signs because there's this series of miracles. That word miracle and sign, it's the same word. If you, if you learn Greek, it, it means sign or miracle. That's what miracles are for, is to signify something, not just to impress, but to signify who Jesus is. And so there happen to be seven of them depending on how you count, which I'll get to that in a minute. But if you glance at chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, it's the sign where Jesus turned water to wine. So water to wine would be, if you want to fill in that blank, it's simply water to wine is the first sign. Then if you go to chapter 4, beginning in verse 46, he heals the official's son, okay, who comes to him for miraculous healing. Chapter 5, beginning in verse 2, uh, to me, again, this was also, this is just one of those famous passages from growing up as a kid in church was when he heals the invalid who couldn't jump into the pool when the waters are stirred up. Uh, that's found in chapter 5, verses 2 through 15, healing the invalid. So let me just kind of reiterate these. Sign number one, water to wine. Sign number two, healing the official son. Sign number three, healing the invalid, the one by the pool of Bethesda. Uh, then, in uh, then the fourth sign is chapter 6, which we glanced at earlier. It has an I am statement in it, feeding the 5,000. Feeding the 5,000. Chapter 6 is just this jam-packed chapter. I mean, he, he feeds the 5,000. And that, the, the next sign is, is the very next account, beginning in verse 16, walking on water. I mean, you talk about a day. If you're, a, if you're a disciple of Jesus, you've had a day by the time you go to bed. Feeding 5,000, walking on water. Uh, he ends up sharing in chapter 6. This is where Jesus runs a lot of the crowds away when he says that you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood if you want true life in you. So, so uh, talk about key passages. John chapter 6 is just a massive chapter. Okay, so that's number four and five, feeding the 5,000 and then walking on water. Number six, 
The sixth th- uh, sign, chapter 9, verses 1 through 41, is healing of the man born blind. Okay, very famous passage there, healing the man born blind. And then number 7, sign number 7 in chapter 11. Uh, again, he, he pronounces himself as I am the resurrection and the life in this chapter. This is where he raises Lazarus from the dead. So raising Lazarus. Let me just go over these again in case you needed to fill out your notes in any way. Number one, water to wine. Number two, healing the official son. Number three, healing the invalid. Number four, feeding the 5,000. Number five, walking on water. Number six, healing the man born blind. Number seven, raising Lazarus. Now, when I first mentioned there are seven signs, then I said this little qualifier. And I said, depending on how you count, okay? Let me acknowledge that there have been different proposals on what, uh, what all the seven signs are uh, and just tell you why I would land on these seven. My guess is these are the, the seven that I've given are probably, my guess would be most scholars would land on these seven. But, but the list of signs is debated, okay? Now, now let me just acknowledge you're just humoring me. Let me go on a bit of a rabbit trail, if you don't mind, on this. And I just want to celebrate. This is all in a footnote that I'm reading, and I love footnotes. So j- just let me have my footnote fun for just a moment, if you don't mind. But the list of signs is debated. Okay? Now, six of them are all pretty much agreed on. All right? Number one, agreed. Well, that one says it. Okay? Number two, agreed. By all scholars, pretty much. Number three. And number four, agreed. Number five is not, okay? So number five is not necessarily agreed on by all, but number six and number seven are. So there's something about the walking on water uh, that has caused some to think, well, maybe that's not one of the signs, and so they have other suggestions. So, again, just humor me a little bit more here. Suggestions for the additional sign would include maybe the moment where he cleanses the temple. Okay, so that's found in chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. So some would say that should be one of the signs. Of course, some suggest walking on the water, and I've selected that one, chapter 6, verses 16 through 21. And then others suggest what we looked at earlier for just a moment, chapter 21, verses 1 through 14, the miraculous catch of fish. Okay? So those are the three options that would complete the list of seven, okay? Would it be... Uh, Jesus cleansing the temple in chapter 2, Jesus walking on the water in chapter 6, or the miraculous catch of fish in chapter 21, okay? Now, others, let me just get a little more complicating here. Others consider Jesus' resurrection to be the seventh. All right, that's obviously a very powerful miracle. Uh, So they would consider the resurrection to be the seventh, and therefore it would be the culminating sign. Okay, so let's let's give give a little thought to that. Let me explain why I would include walking on water, okay? I include Jesus walking on water for, I think, three reasons. Number one, Jesus walking on water is a clear, miraculous demonstration of his divine power. It's a clear miracle, unlike the cleansing of the temple. See, so some would suggest the cleansing of the temple. The walking on water, that's a miracle, Okay, and Jesus cleansing the temple is not what we would consider some display of supernatural ability or power. Okay, the second reason I would include walking on the water is because it occurs in the very section of John that is known as the book of signs. Okay, I mentioned earlier verse, chapters 1 through 12, the book of signs. Well, the, the walking on the water fits in that part of the book, unlike the miraculous catch of fish, which is all the way at the very end. Okay, so just that's... That's one reasoning there that I have. Uh, and then I would say, third reason, that the resurrection just kind of stands on its own. Uh, the resurrection clearly is the ultimate manifestation of J- Jesus' divine power. So in other words, the seven signs in the list I've given you, they all in the, kind of this, this completed seventh, uh, seven list point towards ultimately the power of the resurrected Lord Jesus. So... All right, I finished my footnote. Thank you guys so much for that. Sometimes I just need that. You just need a footnote every once in a while. Does anybody agree with me on this? Am I the... Yes, okay. Sometimes, Matt, yes, you just need a footnote every once in a while. Some... If you're bored, it's because you need more footnotes in your life. 
All right, write that down. Okay, back to key passages in the book of John. The foot washing, chapter 13. This is unique to, to John's account. Kind of goes in place of, of where the others would have the communion narrative. Jesus washing the disciples' feet, chapter 13, verses 1 through 20. Then the farewell discourse. So if you're having a conversation over coffee and someone mentions Jesus' farewell discourse, it's John chapter 14 through verse 16. Uh, then, of course, you could really include chapter 17. Uh, I said that wrong a minute ago. John 14 through chapter 16. But you could also include chapter 17 where you have this high priestly prayer. That's a key uh, text in John as well. So if you just read those four chapters, just kind of soak them in. Uh, you'll see how, how much they contribute to the book of John. And then we did already look at the purpose statement of John. That's a key passage, the purpose statement where he says in chapter 20, verse 31, uh, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And then I also mentioned uh, the very last verse of the book. We read that where he says, I suppose that the whole world cannot contain all the books that would be written about what he had done and said. So uh, there, there we are, just taking several minutes in each gospel, just kind of highlighting some of what I consider the key passages in each book. I want to say again, I, I'm sure I didn't mention everything that you would have if you had put the, um, uh, the list of key passages together on your own. I also want to reiterate that this was uh, uh, admittedly selective, okay, which, is, which has a risk to it. I'm not trying to say the rest of the books that I didn't mention are not significant, not in the least. Uh, these are just kind of what has, has become famous in each of them. Okay. All right. We've got to a good little stopping point for just a moment. So why don't we take a few more minutes here and let's give away some books. We're doing pretty good. I don't know that I'll finish all my notes for tonight, but that is no problem. Uh, we'll just wait till next week. Okay. Let me give away a copy of Discipling, How to Help Others Follow Jesus. Who are the not-nots? Yellow is not-nots. Blue is not-nots. I'm just trying to clarify this, y'all. Blue are the students, yellow is the teachers. Okay, that means, guys, that means yellow is the not-nots. Hang in here with me. Yellow is the not-nots. All right, so blue, nots. Here we go. Someone in here is not coming back next week because I just did that. They're like, I can't. I'm not doing this. Well, then you're not if you're not doing it. This book is going to Sophie Rivera. Where is Miss Sophie? All right, congratulations. I'll come to you. Thank you, sir. Congratulations, Miss Sophie. And let's give another copy of this book away. Sale Lewis. Where is Sale? All right, give it up for Sale. Congratulations, sir. And... I'm trying to budget my time here. I think I have one more giveaway uh, time, so let me just do this. I'm going to give away a couple copies of the gospel. The gospel, how the church portrays the beauty of Christ. And let's see, this one will go to Carol Bowling. I saw I, saw, I knew I saw her. Thank you, sir. Congratulations, Carol. And then last one for this particular moment here. Sam Rivera, the Rivera family. Right on. We'll, we'll, meet, we'll meet this way. Oh, I about gave you the I about gave you the garbage. All right, congratulations. Okay, let me jump back up here. Y'all excuse me for doing that, but it has to happen. All right, 510, we're doing good. Okay, <clears throat> we'll go for just a little bit longer here. Uh, what I want to talk about now, I want us to think about, all right, why are there four Gospels? Why are there four Gospel accounts? Uh, and when I'm saying that, uh, I'm really asking from God's perspective. Remember that when we think of the Bible as God's Word, this is going all the way back to the very first set of Ember Lectures. We taught this. 
that the Bible has this dual authorship to it, the divine author and then all the human authors. And uh, we can answer this question from both the divine perspective and, uh, and really kind of the historical, historical perspective. Um, I'm kind of trying to think through why would God inspire this way, okay? Uh, why are there four accounts? Uh, so that's kind of perspective. And I'm not trying to speak for God. I'm just saying this, this is what I think uh, we can kind of conclude about this. Okay, I think that we probably feel pros and cons. All right, that's your blank there, pros and cons. I think, I think we probably feel pros and cons to the fact that our Bible includes four gospel accounts. Now, I realize as soon as I say that, uh, maybe you've never even felt anything about it. So you're like, well, don't tell me what I feel. Well, here's what I mean by that. On the pro side, uh, just like in many things in life, there are numerous benefits when you have multiple accounts and multiple perspectives to consider, okay? It's just a very helpful thing. You can look at it from multiple angles. And so the results can be well-rounded and more substantial. There are more substance to it. So one of the, the pros, one of the benefits... Uh, is that with four gospel accounts, we can say, you know, that's a pretty well-rounded uh, library of biographies about Jesus. We looked at them last week as theological biographies. So it's pretty well-rounded, very s- substantial. you got four different people who have been inspired to write these accounts. And so that's, uh, there, there's, there's a richness there to it. So that's on the pro side. Now, on the con side, and you might be like, what? You know, what could be a negative? Well, it's just how we could feel about things. Uh, Having multiple gospel accounts could make us feel vulnerable to complexity. In other words, like maybe it would feel nice that there was just one and that was just the one that we had to get familiar with instead of the four. It might be uh, simple that way. It might feel that way. So we might feel vulnerable to complexity or confusion, okay, I mean, there are multiple ways you can get confused about the Gospels. Which Gospel has this? Which doesn't have that? How did he put it this way? How did the other one put it that way? Uh, Just some general confusion that that could lead to, perhaps. Or even contradiction. Now, i got to remind you how I put this. I'm not saying there's contradiction in Scripture. What I'm saying is uh, it could, because we have multiple accounts, it can make us feel vulnerable to, are there contradictions in the Gospel accounts? And I think... Uh, probably next week, uh, maybe the week after that, but next week I think we're going to dig in a little bit to that because we, we need to be aware of that type of uh, concern, so to speak, about the gospel accounts. Is Are there contradictions? Okay, so just wanted us to think about well, how, how might we feel knowing that there are four gospel accounts. Now, what I want to do for the next several minutes is, is very heavily borrow from, from uh, Andreas Kostenberger and Richard Patterson in uh, their book, Invitation to Biblical Interpretation. Um, it's one of those that I mentioned last week and, then, and said we, we gave that away probably three or four years ago as one of our giveaways. And so they have a very helpful discussion on this. For the next several minutes, much of what I say, uh, will, much of it will even be quoted. Uh, so I'll certainly try to be nice and clear with their work here. But they provide some helpful parameters here to think this through. Uh, this is often referred to as a problem, Okay. the the problem of having multiple accounts. And so uh, in your blank there, you can write the word problem. Uh, I have it in quotations, and the way that I have it typed out. And, of course, you see, I think in your outline, you see the question mark there. That's what we're talking about. Is it a problem? Okay, now listen to this statement from Kostenberger and Patterson. They say, in the days of the early church, the diversity found in the four Gospels led to attempts to reconcile these differences. Let me read that again and just kind of show you how this resonates with what I was saying about that that we could feel vulnerable to some of these uh, cons of having four accounts. In the days of the early church, the diversity found in the four Gospels led to attempts to reconcile these differences. Now, that's a very telling phrase to me, okay? Very telling. All right, do we really have a problem of differences that we have to reconcile? Now, to be clear, Kostenberger and Patterson, they are not arguing that. That's not at all what they're arguing. They, they, would, they would resonate with us. Uh, they're pointing out that it was perceived as a problem. What do we do? We've got multiple Gospels, and there, there seem to be differences that we need to reconcile. 
okay? So I want us to just acknowledge that that's something that we kind of want to wrestle with, and I plan on doing that more next week. So that is uh, referred to as a problem, and I'm, I'm asking, is it really a problem, okay? Then they give what I would call the reason. That's your next point. The reason for multiple accounts of the Gospels, okay? The main reason is various intended recipients, okay? There are different original readers, recipients of these documents. There was a variety there, and so it helps to have multiple accounts. Now listen to this quote. They, they quote, now I'm about to quote two scholars that quote two other scholars, so I'm, I'm keeping it nice and simple tonight. Gordon Fee and Douglas Stewart, which I've given a book away by those two, I believe, yeah, I believe we've given multiple books probably uh, by those two scholars. Gordon Fee and Douglas Stewart proposed that one of the reasons for the need for multiple canonical gospels is a simple and pragmatic one. Let me just go slow so I make sure we're clear because I know if I read a long quote, we can kind of get lost in the, in the trees there. One of the reasons that we have more than one canonical gospel, we've got four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, one of the reasons, it's a simple and pragmatic reason, just a, just a tangible reason, sort of nuts and bolts reason, and this is it. Each gospel was written to address the concerns of a particular community or group of believers. And since such concerns differed, the gospels could not, for that reason, be identical. Remember, I'm still quoting here. Hence, there arose the need for several different gospels serving Christian communities in various geographical locations. At the same time, all four canonical Gospels were intended for a broad readership, not limited to a particular locale, end quote. Okay, now this is like a reminder from last week. Matthew seems to be written mainly for a Jewish audience. Mark seems to be written directly for Romans, those who live in Rome. Uh, Luke, uh, he, uh, he uh, gives the preface acknowledging the reader Theophilus, and yet there seems to be the broader readership intended of Gentiles, okay, non-Jews. So for Luke, who was a Gentile, writing for Gentiles, and then John seems to be written for Jews who had been scattered as Jerusalem was taken over, and they had to scatter the Jews in the diaspora. And so that's a reminder from last week, and so the point is, the reason that there are multiple accounts is that there were multiple groups get, that needed to benefit from this. So what you have here is a combination of, from God's perspective, he wants multiple accounts, he's orchestrating things as he sees fit in history, and then from sort of the ground level in history, there's just people going to different communities and speaking different languages and from different people groups, uh, Jews or non-Jews, and God's making sure that his word is becoming available for all of them. So that's that's really the best summary, uh, summary reason for multiple gospel accounts. Okay, the next blank is uh, the benefit. Okay, let's just think about the benefit, which I would summarize as a fuller picture. Okay, so we've asked, is it really a problem uh, that we have multiple accounts? We'll hopefully help clear some of that up over the next two weeks. We've identified the reason. It's because there were different readers in mind. Now, what's the benefit? All right, we've already kind of hinted at this. I would summarize it as a fuller picture. Okay, you get a fuller picture. I used the phrase earlier, well-rounded. Now listen again to what Kostenberger and Patterson say. While the four gospel accounts all focus on the story of Jesus, each gospel has a unique contribution to make so that what emerges is a composite, multifaceted picture of Jesus. So one picture, but multifaceted, composite. They go on to say this, the cumulative effect resulting from reading all four Gospels is that readers attain a more comprehensive understanding of the story of Jesus as a whole than if they were only reading one of these Gospels. That's just, just a profound thought. As valuable as the Gospel of John is, and I mean it is, we cannot plumb the depths of the richness of, in the Gospel of John alone, if we only had the Gospel of John, then we would be missing out on what God has provided for us in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So the benefit is a fuller picture. Listen to what another scholar celebrates. He just simply celebrates that the multiple Gospel accounts provide what he calls a finely balanced Christology. So you get a good, balanced, well-rounded theology of, of Christ, his person and work. And he also celebrates that having multiple gospel accounts gives us a wealth of metaphors for describing the kingdom. So even taking one theme, the kingdom, and you realize having multiple accounts, 
It gives us all sorts of ways to learn about and view the kingdom of God. I presume that you could do that for, for many, many themes in the New Testament, not just the kingdom. Uh, you could look at discipleship and see how the four gospel accounts give uh, many different ways to, to view and appreciate uh, the, the role of discipleship in the gospel. You could do it with all sorts of things. Okay, let me give you your next blank. Uh, I want to identify a foundation Okay, like a foundation on which we can kind of rest our views on the multiple accounts that God has given us, the multiple gospel accounts. The foundation is one gospel. One gospel. All right, again, let me quote another scholar here. His name is Nicholas Perrin. He says this, Ancient believers saw the four gospels as diverse manifestations of one and the same gospel. Okay, so there's four gospel accounts. We call them gospels. But they're all manifesting, he used to kind of borrow his word, the one and same gospel. Then he goes on to say there's one gospel because behind the diversity of the four gospels stood the one unifying spirit. Showing again the divine authorship of scripture. Listen to this quote from uh, R.T. France. Another scholar, he says this, the different interpretations of the four evangelists are thus an essential part of the biblical record of Jesus' teaching. In other words, we have to have all of them. He says it will be incomplete New Testament theology that ignores the theological insights of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So if we, have to, if we want to have full New Testament theology, then we have to appreciate all four of the gospel accounts. Now, if you'll bear with me, one more quite long uh, quotation here. Uh, one writer says this. He acknowledges uh, that... Uh, the evangelist, it says it's all the more striking then that although the evangelist, when he says that he's talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're often referred to as the evangelist in, in, in literature about the New Testament. Although the evangelists clearly feel free to alter things to build up their own portrait of the hero. Now, let me, that, that might have sounded alarming to you. What he's acknowledging here is that you can see Matthew chose to write about this in a certain way and Mark chose to write it in another way. For example, Mark decided to let us know that they sat on green grass before Jesus fed the thousands. Okay, it's, He altered his account is what he's talking about. Okay, So he says this, although they clearly feel free to alter things to build their own, their own portrait of the hero, nonetheless, all four still tell essentially the same story. So I was referring to this book when we were talking about uh, the, uh, the Greek biographies having a hero or an important person. So this is the same story that he's seeing in all of the Gospels. And I hope a lot of this sounds quite familiar. Here it is. The ministry of Jesus from his baptism to his death, narrating his great deeds and words, healings and teachings in Galilee and in Jerusalem. Responses to him differ with some believing and following Jesus while others oppose him, which leads to similar plot lines in each Gospel. He continues by saying this, The conflict is between Jesus and the religious leaders of his day, which will eventually result in the formation of the church out of the disciples. Jesus is described in exalted language as Christ, Lord, or Son of God. Eventually, he comes to Jerusalem and is arrested by Jewish leaders, but executed on a cross by Roman authorities. And I love this. He says, and something odd happened afterwards. Talking about the resurrection. There are four gospels with four pictures telling four versions of the one story of Jesus, end quote. Hear that last sentence again. There are four Gospels, and here he wrote it in little g, four Gospels, Gospel accounts. There are four Gospels with four pictures telling four versions of the one story of Jesus. The idea is if four of us were hanging out and something funny happened, then we could all retell that story, we would tell it in our own way, and if you heard all four versions, you'd probably have a richer uh, understanding of what happened. Okay, that, that's my way of taking a few moments, really heavily borrowing on uh, scholars who've poured a lot of thought into this uh, on why we have four Gospels as opposed to uh, just one. Essentially asking, why do we have multiple Gospels? I'm glancing at my notes here, just kind of gauging the time. Uh, we'll go just a few more. I'll tell you what, we'll go a few more minutes uh, and then we'll stop. Uh, the, next, the next three questions kind of dovetail on the one I just tried to answer. So I just asked, uh, asked the question, why four accounts? Now what I want to ask is why, why Matthew, Mark, Luke, then John? Why, why in that order? Okay, why is Matthew first in the New Testament, 
then Mark, then Luke, then John. Let me emphasize here, this is my note to you. This question is historical, okay, it's not a theological question, okay? I'm not saying God didn't orchestrate things to where we have our, our, our uh, canon ordered the way it is, but I'm, I'm thinking just, okay, what, how were these decisions made, even from the human perspective, to where eventually when the Bible was all put together, uh, we find ourselves with Matthew first, then Mark, then Luke, then John. Okay, let me just give some thoughts. Okay, so I've gone from quoting like uh, elite scholars. Now I'm just kind of giving you some of my thoughts. Okay, so you might realize, well, we can tell the difference. You know, I don't know. Uh, here are some thoughts. Number one, Matthew's genealogy makes for a perfect New Testament on-ramp. Okay, so if we went back to the book of Matthew. Now, I am not saying that I'm the only one that thought of this. No. I'm, saying I'm not quoting scholars here. I'm just kind of going on what I've gleaned over the years. Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 18, this genealogy, I mean, it's just a, this wonderful on-ramp from the Old Testament into the New Testament. So that right there would be one good reason to begin the New Testament with the book of Matthew. Okay, let's go to the other end. We talked about Matthew. Let's go to the other bookend, John. Why is it last? Well, my suggestion would be John is so distinct from the other three that it seems to make sense to place him forth. That's one reason, perhaps, one suggestion. I will say that some scholars point out something that has a little, they, you, there's a little more substance to, to their suggestion. Uh, they mentioned that John was written last. Okay, it was just the last one produced, thus being placed last, and that is certainly a, a good reason for it. Uh, but we also know that we just can't help but notice that John is so different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, not overly different, Obviously, we just talked about how similar all four are in their plot line, but there is a distinction to John. So it also seems uh, like the right way, uh, the right place to put him forth. So we have Matthew first, John fourth. Okay, let me talk about Luke before I talk about Mark. All right, so Luke also wrote Acts. So maybe it makes sense to put Luke as close to Acts as possible. You just got John in between. Okay, you talk about that is a simple suggestion right there. I just, hey, maybe that, that's just how it happened. Which means Mark goes second, which is somewhat ironic, since it seems as if Mark wrote first. I think I told you before that if you caught me off guard and asked me what's the first gospel, I might look really dumb as a pastor because I could accidentally without thinking say Mark. Because there's, there's, there's much reason to think that Mark's gospel actually was written first. Okay, I think... Uh, we will get into, let's see, do we get into that tonight? Do we want to wait? Yeah, let's, let's just keep going for a few more minutes here. Okay. All right, so let me kind of explain what I just said. So it's considered that Mark wrote first. I talked about how the first three Gospels are more similar to one another than John. The first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, I've shared before, they're referred to as synoptics. That word synoptic means something like looks the same, sees the same. Okay, so those three look the same, have a very similar viewpoint. Uh, listen to what some scholars have said here about Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The similarities in presentation, especially among the three synoptic gospels, are best explained on the assumption of some kind of literary interdependence. And you're like, I wish you'd stopped before you read that because that just sounds so nerdy. Literary interdependence. In other words, they're saying they're so similar that you can't help but wonder, are, are they using one another? Okay. Let me keep quoting here. Some scholars argue that these similarities are products of the divine inspiration of the synoptic gospels rather than indicating the use of one gospel by another period. Let me explain that. Some are just saying God inspired the Bible. He has the power to inspire every word as he sees fit, which we agree with here at this church. Therefore, if God wanted Matthew and Mark and Luke to say the same things, then he could have done it, and we don't disagree with that. Okay? But there's an interesting question being raised. Again, I quote, But if divine inspiration alone accounts for the similarities between the synoptics, it's difficult to account for the differences. Okay? So they're saying, look, we agree God inspired every word in Scripture. I mean, that is such an important belief of ours. But there's also reason to think that, that God made sure that the, the authors could have used one another. And, and many believe that Mark was written and then Matthew and Luke 
used much of Mark, which we'll see in just a moment. Okay? Let me emphasize here that this view of literary dependence, where we might have one Bible author using another, which, by the way, we just showed Matthew doing over and over and over with the Old Testament. That view of literary dependence does not reduce in one iota the view of divine inspiration that we have for the scriptures, okay? Which is another way of saying we believe that God inspired every word of scripture. This is all just me right here. One could argue, and I would argue this, that this view actually enhances the view of divine inspiration to see that there is a divine governance of the whole process. So not only do I believe that God can inspire Matthew to write what he did and Mark to write what he did and so on and so forth, which I believe happened, I also believe the Holy Spirit can orchestrate things where Matthew can have a copy of Mark available. And all in that inspiration process God's working out, he could use the book of Mark to write some of what he has. So this does not lessen, in my opinion, doesn't lessen one bit our view of divine inspiration. Matter of fact, it kind of seems to enhance it. Now we realize God is covering, governing the entire process of inscripturation, of bringing scripture into being, including his governance over the author's minds, their words, their research, and even utilizing their personalities all along. Okay, uh, So hopefully some of that made sense that I just said there. All right, but let me share with you some interesting statistics that would make some people think that Mark wrote first. Listen to this. This is a quote. Matthew shares about 90% of Mark. 90% of Mark is found in the book of Matthew. Luke, about 55%. So Luke has over half of Mark in Luke. Then it goes on to say this. In the areas where they overlap, one sometimes diverges from the other two. Okay? Here's what he, say, here's what he means by this. Matthew and Mark may agree against Luke. That doesn't mean they're arguing. It just means that they have a similar wording or something, and then the other one is different. Matthew and Mark may agree against Luke, or Luke and Mark may agree against Matthew, but rarely, if ever, do Matthew and Luke agree against Mark. Can you hear the logic there? Let's try this again here. Matthew and Mark, they can agree against Luke. Luke or Mark can agree against Matthew. Again, I'm not talking about arguing disagreement. I'm just talking about differences, distinctions. But rarely, if ever, do Matthew and Luke agree against Mark. That would lend you to think maybe Mark was the source. Listen to these statistics from others. Of the 661 verses in Mark, 500 recur in Matthew in parallel form. In other words, 90%. And 350 verses recur in Luke. Again, about 55%. In addition, there are another 235 verses common to Matthew and Luke that are not found in Mark. This parallelism occurs not only with Jesus' teaching, where one might argue that the early church simply memorized them. In other words, you could say, well, if it's just about what Jesus said, well, they had that memorized, they'd all be saying it the same way, right? We all have famous quotes from people we know, we all would say it the same way. But they explain this. But it happens also with the narrative descriptions of what Christ did. So there's so much similarity to how Matthew and Mark and Luke tell the same story, not just quoting Jesus, but describing what he did or what someone else did. Again, that would lead them to conclude that there's at least one of these being depended on by the others. Now, there's a, a really solid New Testament scholar named Craig Blomberg, and I'm, kinda, I'm, uh, I'm bringing it home here in the next few minutes, if you'll just hang with me on this. Craig Blomberg offers several reasons to view Mark as, the, as a source for Matthew and Luke. Okay, in other words, Mark and priority. We think Mark wrote first. Here are several reasons just for, just for you to kind of consider. Number one, often Mark's details are the most vivid. I mentioned last, last week, Mark is a shorter gospel, but in se several places he's actually more detailed, okay, which makes you wonder maybe, maybe if he was being utilized then the, those using his work would simplify a little bit. Number two, Mark's grammar and style are often the roughest. Okay, so if he has the roughest grammar and style, you can imagine if someone's utilizing his work, they might try to make sure that the grammar is a little bit more sophisticated sounding, this or that. It's kind of weird to think about the Bible like that, but this is real stuff. The different Greek, the different books have different styles. I mean, if we knew Greek thoroughly, we could see it easily. Just like you can hear or read someone like that, that guy's from the south or that guy's from the northeast or whatever, uh, you can see some differences in the way the Greek is here. 
Uh, one of the biggest differences is some Greek seems more educated, more refined than others. Number three, compared to the other gospel writers, Mark narrates more details that could seem embarrassing or even misleading. Now, I want to take a moment here. I don't want this to alarm you. Go to Mark chapter 6, verse 5. I don't want you to misunderstand the point here. Uh, to say embarrassing and misleading, obviously that, that's like a very triggering phrase to use. Uh, there's no intent to trigger anything. In Mark chapter 6, verse 5, this is where... Uh, look, if you look at verse 4, Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. Now, verse 5, And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Now, the point is, someone could argue, well, that just shows that Jesus didn't have power to do it, which is not true. But it, the point is, he was willing to include that verse that says Jesus could do no mighty work there. Now, if we compare that to Matthew 13, there's a typo in your notes. I think you have, this, you have these in your notes, right? Does it say Matthew 13, 8 in your notes there? Or you don't have it? Well, then never mind, because there was a typo in it anyway. If you go to Matthew chapter 13 and find verse 58, okay, this is where we would find what we refer to as the parallel passage to Mark chapter 6. Chapter, 50, uh, chapter 13, verse 58, if you start at verse 57, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household, and he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Matthew says he didn't do it. Mark said he couldn't do it. All right, so you could get the idea, ah, maybe Matthew kind of thought, well, you know, let me, let me try to just put it at a different angle so that we, we don't get a misunderstanding here. Mark is not misleading us. Not at all. But you can see where someone could try to use that verse, which people do all the time, try to use one verse against other teaching in Scripture. Okay? So it might lead you to think, well, maybe Mark wrote first, and then Matthew kind of felt a reason to, to write it differently. Okay? I realize that some of this is kind of like, oh, I've never really thought about this before, and it seems odd. I just kind of sort of take it in for now, and, and by all means, if you want to have a conversation about it, at some point we can sit down. Let me give you Blomberg's uh, remaining reasons why it seems as if Mark would have written first, and then Matthew and Luke would have used Mark as a source in their own writing research. Number four, Mark is the shortest of the Gospels, but he is often narrating in a fuller form. Okay, we've already mentioned that. Number five, almost all of Mark is reproduced in Matthew and or Luke. We've already acknowledged that as well. He says this, number six, quote, quote uh, uh, Blomberg here, Matthew and Luke only rarely deviate from Mark in sequence of passages or nature of wording in the same way at the same time. Whereas Matthew and Mark frequently ag agree against Luke and Luke and Mark frequently agree against Matthew. That's what I said a moment ago, uh, that kind of weird triangle of logic there. Number seven, Mark transliterates into Greek more Aramaic words than the others. Let me explain. When you translate... You say the word agape means love. When you transliterate, you take the letters or the characters in one language and just try to replicate them in the other language. So the word baptize is not really a translation from Greek into English. It's a transliteration from baptizo. Does that make sense? All right, agape and love, obviously they sound very different. It's a translation baptizo and baptize, you can tell, no, we're just going to take that Greek word and use English letters into it. It's a really fascinating thing uh, that I think sheds light on our doctrine of baptism. That's a transliteration. So the point here is Mark transliterates from Aramaic into Greek more words than the others. It's a rougher way to write, okay? And so it might have been polished up with translation more by others who would have noticed that. Two more, another quote here, seems to be no other explanation for why Mark would have admitted, omitted all of the material common to Matthew and Luke if he had known about it. That's just an interesting way of looking at it from the other angle. Why would Mark have omitted all of this other stuff that Matthew and Luke have in common uh, if it had just not already been written? You get the idea that Matthew and Luke could have built on what they had from Mark, not vice versa. And lastly, and again a quote, when one assumes that Matthew and Luke each redacted Mark, in other words, took Mark and kind of 
worked with it, maybe even kind of adjusted it in ways, rearranged it, then consistent patterns of theological emphasis emerge. In other words, what you find as the way that Matthew seems to take Mark and utilize it and shape his material from Mark, you see Matthew seeming to have kind of a consistent approach to his own theological emphases, the same thing for Luke, okay? Now, I know that this is like, Michael, it's been a long time. This is a long lecture. That's some crazy stuff. Uh, but it, it, it's really cool stuff. I think it's important. And let's see here. All right. I, om- I have to finish up real quickly here. Let me do one more section on John just for four or five minutes. And then, uh, then we'll wait to check into Acts beginning next week. This is all from Kostenberger and Patterson. Okay, we've discussed the synoptics. John, we've already acknowledged, is very distinct. Let's just listen to what they say. I think you'll find this interesting. This might be a helpful way to finish. The degree of difference between John and the synoptic gospels suggests that John probably wrote his gospel independently of the other three, although it is likely that he was aware of their existence. All right, did you hear that? So it seems as if John wrote pretty independently, but there are reasons to think that he knew about some or all of the other gospel accounts. And then they explain why. They say it's suggested by several unselfconscious references that appear to betray awareness of synoptic tradition, if not the synoptic gospels themselves. And let me try to put that in simpler language. In other words, there are places in John where without, it's like he didn't even realize it. He was showing that he may have known about the gospel material in Matthew, Mark, and or Luke. They give five examples. He refers to Andrew as Simon Peter's brother, okay? It's just a reference that happens in chapter 1, verse 40. He doesn't explain it. He just refers to him as that. Maybe he found that out reading Matthew, Mark, and or Luke. Uh, The aside in John, chapter 3, verse 24. Not that he found it out, but he's almost like he's quoting it the way they would have written it. It's a better way to put it. Uh, Number 2, the aside in John, chapter 3, 24. There's an aside comment. It's this was before John, referring to John the Baptist, was put in prison, okay? That account doesn't take place at his, but he mentions it, okay? Maybe borrowing from how the others had that account in theirs. Number three, the reference to Jesus saying in John 4, that a prophet is not without honor except in his own country. You compare those, uh, then it's almost like maybe he's uh, being reminded of that and use, utilizing the other sources as well. Number four, the reference to the village of Mary and her sister Martha in John chapter 11. Uh, could be borrowing on when Luke talks about that in chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. And then the reference to the 12 in John chapter 6, verse 67 and 71, even though they're not previously mentioned in the Gospels, in, in John's Gospel. The point is not that John wouldn't know these things. He was a disciple and an apostle. The point is the way he's putting it, it's not like he put that in any of his introductory material. It's almost like he may be just kind of echoing how he's read the others. So these scholars suggest, these pieces of evidence suggest that John wrote his gospel with an awareness of the synoptic gospels while pursuing his own unique purposes and agenda. We're going to finish there. I'll dare say that perhaps may be the nerdiest 15, 20 minutes in Ember Lecture's history. Uh, and I apologize if I lost you a while back at turn three, but I appreciate you humoring me. Uh, I have a pen here that I'll use just to mark where we are. Uh, Lord willing, we'll begin by asking the question, basically, if there are four gospel accounts, why is there only one book of Acts? So we'll start there. Uh, let me close us in prayer. Lord, I thank you for our time tonight. I thank you for your word. I thank you that if nothing else, we're reminded how rich and glorious and, um, and, uh, and wonderful and gracious it is of you to give us your word. And so we want to thank you for it. And God, I thank you for all those who have come. I pray your blessings on them and their family. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Y'all have a good night.